Hello, it's the gloomiest Sunday in London. It's like literally mid-July and the weather is just feels like cozy December. So it was actually the perfect time to read a bit of a dystopian novel. This is Saha by Cho Namju. This is not the first time that I read anything by her. I've talked about her other book, um, Kim Ji Young, Born 1982. I believe I read that book about 2-3 years ago now and I did review it along with another book. It's been on my mind to reread that book and actually compare it to another uh, book that I haven't read yet but I'll get to that in a minute. But anyways, this is the second book that I've read by this author. Currently, it's one of those books... <sighs> my dog's just come and sat down and he's like looking at the camera like, what's going on? This is Taro, my little chihuahua. He's gonna join us. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? This seems to be like the hot topic at the moment in all the bookstores, at least here in the UK. Every time I walked into Waterstones, I've kind of seen it at the front. And it was definitely one that a lot of people were waiting for for a really long time. Because I feel like, or as far as I have heard, as far as like feminist works of art and literature are considered, um, Kim Ji Young was definitely one of those books that a lot of people resonated with. It didn't really matter which country you're from or what your background is. It was almost like a love letter to women around the world to say, you know, these feelings that you're feeling are definitely valid. So a lot of people, I think, were really anticipating uh, what her next book was going to be. And also with translated fiction, I feel like not every single work by that author always gets picked to be translated so for us international readers it's always like a kind of like a mystery on to see what else is going to come out from you know authors we love so i totally understand people's sentiment around this book um and also to say that this is really not anything similar to kim jong if you think about like subject matter but it is actually very um quintessentially uh, Cho Namju if you think about the writing style or the way a top particular topic has been tackled. If you're not particularly familiar with this author, you might have heard of this book called The Feminist Mystique. It's another very popular book when it comes to um, feminism and feminist literature. This is one that I haven't read but I'm very familiar with the book because I feel like I've either heard references or this and that. According to Wikipedia, most reliable source. The book challenges the widely shared belief that fulfillment as a woman had only one definition for American women after 1946 and that is of being a housewife or a mother. So Feminist Mystique basically challenges the concept that, you know, women are happy being a housewife and that is kind of the only ideal goal for women in society and that is where they will find the most amount of fulfillment. And I think this was published in 1963 so you can imagine that um, this was a little bit ahead uh, or America is a little bit ahead of Korea whereas um, Kim Ji-young 1982 was published in October 2016 and Kim Ji-young is kind of considered to be this name if you think about like in British terms like Adam Smith um, like a name that kind of is so common that it's kind of saying like every other every woman out there is Kim Jong because every woman who was born around that time period of like 19, early 1980s, early 1970s, um, this book or the character really represents that entire cohort of the population where, uh, whereas, you know, it's a little bit later in the time, but definitely as women are getting older and they've given birth to their children. And Cho Nam just said that she wrote this book or at least kind of had the idea and grasped the concept fully or knew what she wanted to talk about within the first two months of deciding to write this book and i believe previously she was a screenwriter i'm not entirely sure but i think she was still into writing but this is her kind of first go at something like this and it came so um i guess this came so naturally to her because it felt a little bit like a um, autobiographical fiction. There was a lot of herself that she saw in the character and I feel like this is why it was so easy for her to write something like this. So Kim Jong 1982 was very much a reflection of the very painful but realistic and relatable horrors of patriarchy and what that does to women over time. So, you know, you can imagine how that can be a very, very heavy topic, but she dealt about it in a way that, like, it felt very stingingly real, but also very gripping at the same time. Like, you definitely wanted to keep reading on. It was definitely a page turner. 
now we come to Saha, which is, um, I'm not entirely sure when this was published in Korea. The English translation is just called Saha, but the Korean one, I believe, is called Saha Mansion. And it was published in 2019, so just a couple of years ago. And now Jamie Chang, who is the same person, I believe, who translated her other work, came ahead and translated this. This is to me a dystopian fiction, if I could put it in like a easy kind of category to describe it. The similarity I see between this and her previous work is if Kim Jong was an excellent um, kind of take on patriarchy and what that does to society, this is an excellent take on extremes of capitalism and the effects that can have on society. It might be hard for anyone who's not a part of the current Korean society to realize how much um, you know present-day capitalism in Korea is affecting people on a daily basis but I do think that should be taken into consideration when you're reading this because it is her hot take on capitalism but I think it also shows a little bit more of the author's personality. I When I first started reading this book one thing that immediately I envisioned was Kowloon Wall City um, in Hong Kong I've already gone on a few tangents, so I won't go too detailed into it, but Kowloon Wall City was a part of um, British Hong Kong. It, I think, kind of rose up around the 1950s. From the 50s to the 70s, it's this little part of Hong Kong that kind of gained autonomy. Um, it was technically a part of China within Hong Kong, but nobody was really looking after the people who lived there and it slowly became a little walled city where more and more, I guess, people who were forgotten by society just ended up there. To me, it's one of those, you know, stories or part of history that really was so painful to read about, but also just, you know, just it's such a real depiction of what happens when society forgets about certain people or neglects certain people. But there was so much solidarity and I feel like more than anything when I was reading about this uh, place, it spoke to me in ways I didn't realize it would or like I brought about feelings that I didn't really re think it would. So that in itself, I would really encourage you guys to look into. It's called Kowloon, Walled City. And this time when I was in Hong Kong, I did go around the area and I could really see how this could have been a reality in the past. This whole city was demolished in 1994, the year I was born. So, you know, there's not really anything, you know, people can't really see it anymore, thank God, because it was really, really dangerous. But it also displaced a huge group of people, a massive um, population from that city. And till today, I think it's really hard to tell what exactly happened to those people or where they are now. Um, but that would be another very interesting documentary or story to follow. I feel like the beginning of this book really gave me a Kowloon feeling and then when I looked up a couple of things online and it was definitely one of her inspirations for this book which is very evident. So Saha itself is referring to the Saha estates and Saha estates are just like this uh, kind of plot of land with multiple apartments and buildings where certain people live and this particular apartment building is in a place called town so town initially we don't really get a history of what it was called before but it's kind of like this corporation town you know there were locals it was a small town one day this massive corporation came and it kind of started taking over so what happened was you know like if you think about um some of these big big corporations apple tesla um i don't know the big ones google they go a little bit outside the city and they take over these little towns per se and then they build a town itself and you know everything you could possibly need is within your work environment and it kind of starts like that but then it goes deeper where actually it's like one of the best case examples was i've been to the toyota city in um next to Japan in Nagoya and that very much felt like you know all the people who work for Toyota lived there breathe there and just all of that but slowly this corporation in this case which seems like kind of like a medical uh, company and it has a lot of patents and it's like a very very powerful company when it comes to the field of medicine and it slowly starts taking over because the government um, of this particular place they are in 
heavy debt and so the corporation is like okay we'll just buy the town off of you um or it loans the sorry it loans the government some money and eventually when the government can't pay them back it eventually buys it out so now this entire town is autonomously owned by this corporation so it's like a corporate state kind of affair and sahara estates is like this forgotten piece of land where all the people who are not really granted resident status or like you basically you you're either a i guess l1 l2 which is basically a citizen or you have something below that which is like if you think about it in our class system there's upper class then there's people who work for the upper class and then below that there's like people who are not granted any in the uk i think you know there's words like underclass to refer to certain people but in this case these are people basically no one wants and they're called sahas and most of the time it means that you live in saha estate and there's nowhere you could go why this little plot of land was um, ignored by the government and not really you know demolished or like you would think that the government having power over the entire region would definitely crack down on a place like this and just you know make it disappear but no initially they just kind of let it be and it receives very little support from the central government of the town um but yeah people there kind of go on with life and you are introduced to this like really interesting set of characters i think this book is like one of the most character driven books i've read in a while um you get to learn about a few different people who live in the estates and this book is so character driven that i don't even want to mention names or anything about it i just want to give you a general gist of the book and my thoughts on it okay so i'm not going to go too much into the plot but the plot follows multiple people and their stories of what might have brought them to live in a place like this which is technically unregulated technically not very sanitary not very easy and comfortable um so what drives you to live in a place like this a lot of the people were initially people who are native to town that have been pushed out because they didn't really have anything contributable to society that the town uh, folks deemed like is actually of benefit to them eventually they were from um i mean if you think about it mainland that's how they're calling it which gives me major hong kong versus china kind of an affair but yeah people were from the mainland and then they escaped to saha estates because things happen or they went fell into some kind of like danger and stuff and they just wanted to escape initially there is like this little i think in the beginning of the book there is a little thing this was really helpful so you get a drawing of what the estates look like and there is um a custodian at the beginning but there is also like a little residence kind of committee very loose committee but they do put together their heads to kind of decide who can and cannot stay in this place um you get to learn about the stories of like two siblings who are i would say more or less the central characters but also an older lady who lives there the actual custodian of the place and just multiple people who live there and i think what is so interesting is that learning these different stories they're not like ones that you would really expect like you might think that oh someone did this and they ended up here like i just feel like every single story and every single character was very original very very interesting to read about one criticism i have seen about this book again and again is a lot of people said that the ending was trash and to me i think to a certain extent i can see why they feel that i definitely can but i also feel like if you are the kind of person who likes reading dystopian novels like hunger games or some books that have like a kind of like a hopeful ending then i don't think this one is for you because there is no hope in fact throughout the book you see a lot of people losing hope and they're kind of and throughout the book there's this strong sense of resignation from its characters which can be really really disheartening but if you think about um like i give you the example of hunger games if you talk about this other book which i also think um is a really good example of you know if you like this you like this is 1984 which is one of the most iconic classics there is i think most people have read this book um this book at the time it was published i don't really know what people said about it but this is not the most hopeful thing on earth okay this too has the most wacky ending and i think to a certain degree it was very hard for me to even get there because i was just like turning the page being like i can't read this this is too painful um instead of making it gory and weird she basically took the route of like trying to I agree the ending was a bit bizarre but I think what she was trying to get to is that there is no fighting the system because at some point it just gets to the point that there is no fighting the system and another book I want to talk about in this 
part is Human X by Han Kang and if you know me, Han Kang is one of my favorite authors she's also a Korean author she recently read the book, uh, wrote the book Greek Lessons which I still haven't finished this is one of my favorite books and I, this is about the Gwangju uprising that happened in South Korea I believe it was in the late 80s um, but one of the most painful reads but also one of the most impactful books I've ever read and why I mentioned this book is because there's something in this um, book called The Butterfly Riot uh, where you hear that at certain point people did fight against this, you know, corporate state and being pushed out and being pushed to the sidelines and how that ended up and how many people um, were affected by these riots and why since then there hasn't really been anything like the riots. And I guess to a certain degree it also like this is a bit of a spoiler so if you want to skip ahead like 10 seconds you can but I think the custodian of this place is the person who uh, was a big part of the butterfly riots and someone who actually you know the only resolution he managed to negotiate at the end of it was you know being left alone and having Saha estates to themselves to me that is the impression it gave me that he's you know one of those people who kind of kept fighting for something but what in the end he ended up getting was just this little piece of land for him and his people to live in. Um, I don't know if that's a good reading or not but that's the impression I got. This book did make me think about the fact that you know are we at the golden age of capitalism where you know people are being pushed to their limits but at the same time is it only going to go more downhill from here as the kind of that gap between rich and the poor kind of keeps widening and there's a lot of people going to be left behind um with very little power to kind of come out of the situation because initially the whole idea was that in a capitalistic society people really have the potential to kind of you know make their own dreams come true and push themselves and get out of situations but when it it's just two or three corporations that are taking power and in, you can really say that in the case of Korea there are a few corporations that have ultimate power it becomes very blurred what the lines are between a controlling government and a controlling corporation and I think that's what is the strongest point about this book because this is not a matter that should be taken lightly in fact i think this is a really interesting piece of, piece of literature to kind of look back on and think like you know we have been warned very rightfully so that this might be an issue um and maybe few conglomerates or uh corporations in the world should not have the ultimate power um but we don't really fear i guess big corporations as much as we fear the government and we've seen the i guess you know negative parts of a dictatorship but we haven't really seen anything or like we don't even we can't even comprehend right now what might happen if there is a corporate dictatorship somewhere so it is truly really really scary i think another thing that this book just shows is the i guess how hard it is to fight against something that you don't quite see and you don't understand and in this case the government or the parliament was really like a puppet parliament it was run by these seven people apparently but nobody really knew who these people were and most of the time even with corporations and stuff you just see the people running like the ceo cfos but there's also a board of members there's so many other people pulling the strings so it really shows you that even though you have these puppets really at the forefront of like this is what's actually happening there's so much more going on behind and you know so many other people putting in money towards these um, corporations who are actually pulling the strings so it is scary and then there's also a lot of commentary and talk about like immigration status and just where how even people who actually build a town can be left behind right like because at some point you needed these people but they're very very quickly forgotten so it's almost like if you don't keep up you will be forgotten no matter how hard you work or what you do in a way, you can say the same thing about um, Korean people who were, you know, in their their youth was during the 70s, 80s, and even like early 90s, who are now, you know, coming to later in their life and realizing that they are the people who built South Korea to be where it is today. And, you know, they went through a lot of struggles to get to the country to this point. Then why is it that they are the ones who are being left behind? The country is superb for the young generation, maybe, to live in because it's very developed and it's moving really fast. Although the younger generation has its own kind of issues with uh, competition and you have to be in one of the kind of three 
top colleges to get anywhere in life they had their own struggles but also the older population the people who actually rebuilt the entire country after it was torn apart by war have kind of been left behind and that just shows that you know no matter how hard you work for your country or the corporation you too can be forgotten if you're not kind of the people they deem to be of importance or someone who can benefit them um, and as a last point, I think what it really raises and something that took me back to kind of the Kowloon stories that I heard was this concept of solidarity between the people who lived in the Sahai states and how individuality is something that is so highly rewarded by the capitalistic system that more often than not be being at home and always staying at home is very rewarded and you know you can just stay home everything is delivered to you just keep shopping whatever you need gets you know delivered to you at home you don't really need other people you can live more and more individualistic materialistic um, lives and that's how personally i live too i'm more and more with time deciding that i really enjoy my own company there's less drama there's positive and negative to everything i think this really really nice to spend a lot of time with friends and family i'm definitely one who loves to you know go out and meet people but also i think i'm definitely getting more and more comfortable just being happy at home in my own little cozy environment so i can really see that she's also kind of warning us that your individualistic i guess tendencies are not just like self kind of made we're not just all becoming social recluses by choice it's how you know this type of lifestyle is encouraged and is um rewarded so we tend to feel more and more comfortable becoming like that because you know it's less hassle if i break it all apart there's so many incredible parts of this book and i think overall as a story it didn't really pack a punch i didn't find anything in general like oh my god that was incredible but i do think it brought about or brought forward a lot of interesting conversations that need to be had and i hope that this will almost sit as a premise for a lot of interesting works to come um but yeah that was saha by sukcho namju and if you have read it i would love to hear your thoughts and if you think that anything i said here in this video changed your opinion of the book let me know as well um yeah i'm slowly transitioning this channel to be primarily my book channel now so i might eventually do a couple of vlogs but yeah subscribe if you enjoyed and also this is my instagram um i don't always plug myself in but since i'm not posting a lot of personal stuff here anymore but if you do want to keep up with like what i get up to outside of the reading world then you can follow me there but that's all i love you guys thank you so much for kind of coming and listening to me talk about books it's my favorite thing in the world and i'll see you next time